The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grand Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask her questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live and to Ask Dr. Doreen. I'm Shannon Penrod and excited to be here with you guys this morning. You have no idea we had such a fine, fun time getting online this morning. Uh, but we were here. We made it. We're live. Today is September 1st, 2021. We've been away for uh, about two weeks now and we're happy to be back. And look who we have. The creme de la creme. We have Dr. Doreen Grandpuchet here with us live this morning and thrilled to be here with you guys. Uh, in just a minute, we're going to open up and uh, have you guys ask questions. And it's going to be wonderful because as you know, if you watch the show, Dr. Grampiche is a true expert in the field of autism. She donates this time to be able to answer your questions. We do ask you to be as specific as possible. But remember that there is no expert in any field, but especially this field that could give individual specific advice in this format. So you won't expect for her to give you individual specific advice, but you will give her enough information so that you can take a tour of her beautiful mind and hear what she has to say about the topic you're talking about. Go back to the experts who have eyes on the situation and get the help and support that you need, which is a really wonderful thing. And we thank you, Dr. Grand Pichet, for being here. I'm going to let you talk in a second, I swear. Uh, <laughs> I know, it's like, it's like, when is she going to breathe? I, I got to get a word in that twice. That's what all yeah. Um I do want to say a couple of things. We're live right now on our homepage, autism-live.com. Uh, please write in on any of those if you have a question that you want to ask. We're live in a bunch of other places. Don't forget, we are the number one rated autism podcast. Okay, so hi everyone. <laughs> Unfortunately, Shannon's screen and voice have um, frozen. So I guess I'm going to take a moment and welcome everybody back. We all were uh, on vacation for a short period of time and we're really happy to be back. I uh, hope that all of you guys had a wonderful summer and I know many of our kids are all starting school now. So this is kind of an exciting time. Uh, and depending on which state or country you're in, your child might be uh, still, unfortunately, doing school from home um, and online, or others might be doing uh, actual school, which is kind of interesting for our children right now. Um, hi, Fite, nice to see you. Um, yeah, yesterday I was talking with a mom who was telling me that in, at least in the Los Angeles area, uh, the way that they're handling this new Delta variant of the virus in classrooms, uh, because children are in most schools in LA, uh, back in class, um, and they all have to be, uh, they have to either show proof of vaccine or what happens, which is very and then, of course, they're all wearing masks, which I think is unbelievably difficult. I can't even imagine wearing a mask for eight hours, seven hours all day. It's just unbelievable to me. But uh, one of the things that she said to me that I thought must be very difficult for our kids 
is that when one child uh, is exposed or uh, contracts COVID uh, in the morning, so of course the child's parents might call in and say, hey, my child is sick or my child has had exposure. Um, and then in the morning, the teacher will go to the classroom where the child was and they will select all of the children who sat around that particular child and all of those children then have to quarantine for two weeks. So those children are pulled out immediately. The parents are called and they have to stay at home for two weeks. And I just think that this is, it must be so traumatic and, and stressful for so many of our families um, or all families, I guess, dealing with this kind of thing. So uh, hopefully where you are, you're not uh, experiencing too much of that. And hopefully you are, uh, your children have started to establish some sort of routine again. Um, it is very, very difficult. You know, I remember at the beginning of COVID uh, 2020, uh, a lot of the children were having a very difficult time just adjusting to having to be home and not being able to go to school. And now it's the other way around. And now they're adjusting again to a different lifestyle. Hi, Shannon. Nice to have you back. <laughs> I've just, just been talking for the last five minutes. It's the only way you can get a word in edgewise is for yeah. my kick out. It's all good. That's right. I planned your internet blackouts there. <laughs> I, think, I think we can get started though. We are starting to get questions. Wonderful. I can't see the questions, of course. And we have oh. questions already written in. Can I take just a brief moment here at the start though? This is the first live show that we've done since we lost the great, great advocate Ed Asner. And yes. I just a moment um, to throw my loving arms around all of you because this is a loss for all of us, and especially for our our friends and 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 what I consider family over at the Ed Asner Family Center, all of Ed's children and his grandchildren, and all of the people that work um, so tirelessly at the Ed Asner Center. We just want to send our love and condolences out to them. And uh, this is a tough one. I think I think we all were aware Ed, Ed led a wonderful, full life. Uh, he would say that, you know, this this is not a tragedy because he, he died right before his 92nd birthday. So, you know, this, this is not, um, you know, he would have said this, this is not the great tragedy, but it is a loss, nonetheless. Yeah. It's a loss for our uh, our entertainment community because of the amazing work that he did throughout his life. But I'm amazed, uh, Dr. Grampiche, at how many people are like, oh, I had no idea that he was such uh, an incredible advocate for the autism community. Someone dear to me said the other day, I didn't realize, I, she, they, she said, I knew he had grandchildren on the spectrum. I didn't realize he had a son on the spectrum. And um, and yeah. the lot of people who said they didn't realize how much he had done for the actor unions. This man was somebody who towed the line, showed up, did for others on a daily basis. I personally will miss him. I know you probably have something you want to say as well, but it is a loss. Yeah, it is definitely a loss. And I would say that he uh, he was an amazing guy. I mean, first of all, uh, and, and I have to say, I think, you know, so is his son, Matt, and I think, and his son's wife, Nava, I think they're all amazing people. Um, because first of all, Ed, I think I found out that Ed um, had family affected by autism a long, long time ago. It would have been probably, gosh, I think I was an undergrad at UCLA. So it was a long time ago. And he started already doing some kind of fundraising and activities for uh, individuals on the spectrum. And this is, we're talking, you know, 30 years ago, maybe more. And then, um, and then at that point, I, as I got to learn more and more, of course, I met Matt and Nava and I met Ed. And what always uh, amazed me about him was that he just, no matter what was going on with his own health or 
aging, he was up for these events and he was front and center and he was giving speeches and talking to people and, and, you know, and then it, it was, in, not only was that incredible, but then you'd see him all of a sudden in a new film. And you'd be like, how is this man doing all of this at the age of 90? Like, how is that even an incredible person? And he did do fantastic work. And of course, the, the money that they raised and the um, Ed Asner Family Center has helped so many people, has, has been such a wonderful home to so many individuals. And uh, I just, it's a huge loss in, in our world. It's a huge loss. And uh, yeah, my, my, uh, I, I also just send my love to Matt and Alba and all of their family. And, and um, yeah, we, we will do whatever we can to support them. Right, Shannon? Absolutely. And I want to remind everybody that Ed was so thrilled in his later years that he does consider the Family Center his life. And yeah all of his time and his fundraising uh, were going to that. And I want to encourage people, if you feel, if you are feeling this loss and want to be able to do something, a donation of any size, you know, $5 makes a difference. $5 mm -hmm. send in makes it possible for someone to go to Camp Ed. And, and so that's a, that, and that's a, a life-changing thing for the entire family. Uh, I know this for sure because my son is a camp counselor during Camp Ed uh, and has had an amazing experience there as a camp counselor. So um, there's a wide variety of services that they provide there, classes for individuals on the spectrum, counseling for family members. It's really an incredible place. Please feel free to make a donation. You can go to theasnercenter.com. Uh, we also have links on our Facebook where you can go and make a donation of any size in his name. Um, it really has the potential to make a difference. We're going to be talking uh, little snippets about Ed all week, especially on Friday, because I know um, Nancy particularly was feeling the loss and she's got an Ed story she wants to tell on Friday. So stay tuned for all of that. But Ed would not want us to belabor that. Ed would want us to get to the questions that you have. I've got some questions that came in in the last week, Dr. Grampuche, or you've got one that you can see there that you want to take. Um, yeah, one that just came on online for us. It says, hi, Dr. Doreen, my kid is diagnosed with high-functioning autism. Will she benefit from ABA therapy, play therapy? Thanks for suggestions and advice. And uh, yes, I want to just quickly hit on that because that is, you know, your child is absolutely a perfect candidate for ABA therapy. And uh, because obviously a child with, uh, who, who has his high functioning, and what that really means is that they just have less severe symptoms or they are, you know, their symptoms are uh, easier to catch up on. Uh, they're less debilitating in terms of being able to adapt to a normal life. So I would say, yes, uh, I would definitely do ABA therapy because with some help, just look at it as, uh, you know, tutoring. Um, and with some help, your child can very likely uh, just go on and do what all of his peers are doing um, and have a very healthy, happy life. Uh, I, you know, play is a part of ABA. ABA teaches our kids all different types of skills everything from um, language to adaptive to play to cognitive skills, et cetera. So, uh, you know, play is just part of it. ABA is kind of the, uh, the difference between, uh, you know, ABA, ABA itself is just a teaching technique, let's put it that way. Um, and yes, I, uh, I hope that answers your question. So please do get into some ABA therapy. Um, there was another quick question that said, how do you differentiate between a loss and a tragedy? And I think, Shannon, that was in response to us talking about Ed. And yeah. of course, it is a loss and a tragedy because he was such a great man that it is, it is a tra loss for so many of us. And I, all I meant by that is that, um, you know, in conversations that I have with people who are at, at what they deem the end of their life, I mean, one of the last conversations that I had with Ed, he was like, well, you know, my nineties, like yeah. it come to the recognition of the fact that, you know, one way or the other, he was in the end 
life. And what I mean by that is when we see young people who are cut down in their prime and didn't get a full opportunity to do to do the things that they were meant to do and the things that they wanted to do, I consider that a total tragedy. And uh, when when was older dies, sometimes people go, well, you know, they lived a full life as if we're not going to mourn. And so I was just making the distinction that Ed did leave a, lead a full life so that we don't have to feel bad about him not getting the opportunity to do the things that he wanted to, but it does not negate that we all have the right to feel the loss. No one, he's one of a kind and no one can ever take his place. So that's all I meant by that. I hope that clarifies that. Can I go to a question, Dr. Grampiche, that came in uh, this week? Somebody wrote, uh, so I'm an 18 year old female and I have been months searching about autism and I'm pretty sure that I am autistic myself. And I feel so validated and relieved always when I hear experiences from other autistic people. But since March, I had a depressive episode, which probably was caused by burnout because finished high school and started university. And I started therapy with a psychologist. I uh, reunited all of my efforts and asked her if I could be on the spectrum. And she me to write out all of the traits that I think make me, make me part of the spectrum. And when she read the list, she only said that I was HSP, which I'm not sure what that stands with, HSP with social anxiety. This is what she told me when we met. And she said that she doesn't like diagnosis because she believes it can make people restrict themselves to their diagnoses. I don't know how to feel. I can't stop crying while I write all of this. What should I do? Maybe I'm not autistic and just believe it to make myself feel better. I, and I just want to send this lovely human being that wrote this a big hug. But I want to hear from you, Dr. Grampy, someone who diagnoses people on a regular basis. Yeah. So first of all, I think uh, HSP is referring to a highly sensitive person with social anxiety. So I think what this therapist was telling um, our viewer is that you don't have autism. What you have is you're just very sensitive and you have social anxiety disorder. Now, I guess I wish this person was live with us right now, Shannon, because I would ask them a question which would be, the last thing they wrote on there, right? Do you, can you read their last sentence? They said, maybe I'm not autistic and just believe it, make myself feel better. Right. So my question is, why does it make you feel better to believe you are autistic? That's a really important question because uh, you should you really investigate that a little bit. Um, it's almost, I feel like, if you had a name for what is making life difficult for you, I feel like it would give you a couple of different things. Maybe it would give you a sense of belonging to a particular group. And maybe it would also give you a sense of relief because you feel like it's not your fault. It's outside of your control or something like that, right? So if that is the reason, then let me just tell you, you don't need a name for it. You can uh, just, you should just, now that you've done actually a big part of the work, which is you made a list of all the symptoms or things that you feel place you on that spectrum. Now, whether or not you actually qualify for that label, is a kind of a different thing. The label is based on a specific number of symptoms within each area. It's kind of, it's just very dogmatic the way that it's set up is that you must have, uh, you know, three symptoms in this section, two symptoms in that section, it just has to be. But that aside, you know, you do, you probably have a lot of the symptoms. You probably feel very much like individuals who are on the spectrum. So what now? So let's just tell ourselves, what if you did have the diagnosis? What if this individual is wrong? What if they're right? It doesn't matter. What happens now? So you now have a series of symptoms, and what you need to do is figure out what you want to do with them. 
Are they okay? Do you want to leave them alone? Are you able to thrive in life? Or do you need help altering them in some way? Maybe making certain skills stronger. Uh, maybe uh, support that helps you not get upset about certain things. Maybe support that teaches you how to socialize with others or to see their perspective. I don't know what your symptoms are, but whatever they are, I think it's important that if you're struggling, which it really does sound like you're struggling, you have now identified the various symptoms that are causing you to struggle. So let's go ahead and find help to change those things, to strengthen you, whether it's autism or social anxiety. Believe me, I know people who have social anxiety disorder who struggle through more than an individual with autism. Social anxiety in itself is extremely debilitating as well, and there are many, many, many people who suffer from it, many people who need both cognitive behavioral help as well as medical help. So it doesn't matter which category you really fall into. It matters more what you want to do with it. And so, you know, I'd be happy to take a look at uh, meet you, help you figure out exactly which group of people you fall into. But I'm telling you, sometimes when I diagnose kids, I'm much more focused on the next step, which is now that we have the diagnosis, what are we going to do? You know, now that we know there are certain things that are causing this individual to struggle, what are we going to do about it? And that's really where you should be thinking. I love that, Dr. Grant Pichet. I, I, I think back as you were talking to over the years, all of the individuals that I have interviewed who got their diagnosis later on in life. And I, there was one gentleman that uh, I, it just struck me. He said, you know, when I got my diagnosis, it was like getting to myself for the first time. Yeah. That so many aspects of, of things that as as he was looking up and he was like, oh, this reminds me to a T and that there was something healing about that for him. Um, but the other part of it that I hear from all of them is that then they feel that they are, um, instead of feeling like an outsider, sort of that thing that Alex Planck that he named wrong planet for, because mm -hmm. he felt he was born on the wrong planet, but it gives them uh, a sense of community, as you said, a mm -hmm. fellowship tribe. And yeah. They belong to the club. And I yep. think that, you know, I think a lot of people feel different and on the outside and how important it is to find your core group. But even within the autism community, there are lots of groups. Uh, I always, you know, said I don't fit in anywhere. You know, I, I would have friends that would belong to this pocket or this pocket or whatever. But the day that my son got a diagnosis, all of a sudden, I, I have a you know, a membership card to the Autism Mom Club that welcomed anywhere. I can go into any bank, <laughs> I can go into any grocery store, and I can meet other moms of kids on the spectrum. And I don't have to explain to them. I don't have to ask for forgiveness. I get to show up as me, and I'm accepted, and my kid is accepted, which, you know, is a big gift to be a oh, part yeah. of that. Yeah, I get that, Shannon. I get it in a different way because remember, I'm I'm. For, uh, here's an example. I'm Iranian, right? And no matter where I go, like when I started at UCLA and I was extremely young, and uh, you get lost in a university of that size when you're 15. So I met other Persians, other Iranians, and we immediately became a group, right? And today, if you look at it, probably most of my friends are still Persian, but I have friends that are American, you know, South African, European, whatever it is. And over time, I'm part of multiple groups, just like you. Um, but there, you go back to the core group of people that you have the highest similarity with, of course. And I completely understand where this individual is coming from, because it does give you a sense of community. It does give you a sense of explaining why you are the way you are, right? Like, you know, it, it, it would be odd if I wasn't Persian and I celebrated Iranian New Year the way we do, which is to jump over fire. You know, you do. You, you know what I mean? So I want to do that here. This year oh, yeah. Absolutely. We definitely will make sure of that. 
So that's kind of what I'm saying. I get it. I, I understand. And the, the bigger issue, I think, is just focusing on, because I, I just was so um, really worried about how much this individual is struggling, right? I mean, she said she's crying as she's writing this. And that breaks my heart. And for me, it's like, okay, I'll tell you that you fit in. That's fine. If you think you have those symptoms, just assume that you fit into that group. Now let's help. Let's get yeah. you out because I just don't want this person to be sad, you know, and feeling lost because uh, it's, gosh, I can't even imagine if they have both social anxiety and some of the symptoms of the spectrum and they're just trying to figure out where they belong and they're so devastated and stressed out. Yeah, yeah I think you always start every day with a base of whatever it is that you're feeling is okay. Absolutely. And that you're okay and and you are different than everybody else yes and, and that's okay if yes. we could all wake up every morning and start from that space and and throughout the day as people tell her that she's not doing it the way that she's supposed to or whatever it is that people are you know what they say about people hanging their bleep on you yeah you could start from a base of she's okay we all are okay everything we feel is okay and and that it's okay to be different wouldn't that yeah. be a great, uh, it'd be a great world if we could all see. but it's true and it's true for everybody who's on the spectrum and everybody who suspects they might be on the spectrum you're okay um and there are other people i had somebody tell me recently they said i think i might be on the spectrum a parent because we all think this at some point. And she said, I said, well, why do you think that? Tell me, tell me why you think that. And she said, because I constantly have a song playing in my head. Oh. And, and she said, and I, because I'm in the grocery store and I'm bopping out to a song and my kids tell me, stop it. And, 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 and she said, I, I have a, the soundtrack of my life is constantly going in my head. And I said, oh, is that odd? I do too. She yeah. Like, you do? You yeah. do? I said, sometimes it's in the background and sometimes it's in the forefront and I'm singing a song as I'm walking through the house. You do? And and I never shared that with anybody before, but then as I talk to people, everybody's like, yeah, I do that too. Isn't that funny yeah. that, that we would assume I'm the only person who does that? And she was like, oh, I feel so much better knowing I'm not the only one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very interesting. I did tell her that that, that alone did not qualify for her diagnosis. <laughs> Right. It's like, okay. It's funny you say that because, you know, when we're students studying psychology, everything we read, we start to diagnose ourselves and everyone we know based on those things, right? Yes, because I think if anybody reading uh, the, the traits of autism, there, you should identify with at least a couple of them. Um, yeah. Because we, you know, that's a very real thing. Now I have more questions, or do you want to take one that you're seeing? Uh, sure. Let me take a couple. There's, uh, there was a follow up from the previous one where we were telling uh, the um, Ashworth that uh, ABA is good for high functioning kids, and um, the follow up is um, from various forums. I have read that ABA therapy involves placing instructions and then some kids get very upset and tend to tra tantrum is that a natural behavior do you have any advice for parents so um, that's a great question first of all and i just quickly want to hit on that and let me just say so first of all a good aba program should be uh, balanced so that when your child is upset um, they are also providing enough activity that is rewarding. Um, but I just want to start from a different angle and say, you know, usually with any child, if you place demands on them, if you ask them to do things that they don't want to do at that particular time, they'll be a little bit upset. Any child, a child off the spectrum, right? So let's think of a child who wakes up in the morning and they just want to hang out at home and watch cartoons. And you say, oh, I'm sorry, you got to get dressed and go to school. And they get upset and they don't want to get ready to go to school. Or the child who is afternoon, evening, and they're running around playing. And you say, sorry, it's time for a bath and bed. And they don't want to go do that. So anytime a child doesn't want to do something, they're going to get a little bit upset. 
Now, with typically developing kids, we set rules and we say, I'm sorry, you have to go to bed. I'm sorry, you got to get up and go to school. And it's the same thing with our kids on the spectrum. Unfortunately, our kids on the spectrum have a few more things that we just have to say no to, a few more things that we have to push them through. So yes, like when they're going through ABA and we're trying to teach them just let's say um, not to tantrum, but instead of tantruming, to ask for something. Or let's say we're trying to teach them not to hit someone when they want something, but to ask. Or not to run away, but to you know ask for a break. All these types of things, they're going to uh, object. They're going to be upset and they're going to tantrum. And this is, it is natural in the sense that it's the beginning, like it's a reaction. Right. But what we're also trying to teach our kids is that if they have a reaction, if they feel, uh, you know, upset, if they feel like there's too much pressure, that they use language to express themselves as opposed to tantruming and crying. So when a child in ABA, let's say I ask the child to do something, they tantrum and start crying. The appropriate response is not to give in and allow the child to do what they want to do, but it's to ignore the tantruming and crying as much as possible and to teach the child to actually ask in a more appropriate way. So an example of that would be a child is in ABA therapy and uh, they're playing with a toy and you ask them and they come and sit down and you're like, can you put the toy away now because it's time to work? And they don't want to put the toy away and you take the toy and you put it away and they start crying or tantruming or hitting you. And the whole concept of ABA says, okay, don't give them back the toy because if you give them back the toy, they learn that crying and tantruming and hitting you and all that is effective. So they're going to keep doing that in the future. And we don't want our kids to cry anytime they have to put something away right? So instead, you just keep working and you teach the child to say something like, can I have the toy back? And when they say that, and if it's the appropriate time, you do give them the toy back. So ABA is all about teaching our kids what is an inappropriate response and what is an appropriate response, what's appropriate communication and inappropriate communication. And I will say it's, you know, in that sense, it's extremely, extremely effective, and it is absolutely the best thing, even for a high-functioning child. Imagine when they're with their peers or in school, and if the teacher says, hey, guys, everybody put your stuff away, we're going to get started, and the, the child says, no, I don't want to, and they throw, no other peer is going to want to interact with them, right, because our peers don't do that. So a lot of the stuff that's being taught, I, there's a series of books, I, I, I don't like this word, but, and I forget the name of the author, um, but they're very good books and they're just about humanity. They're not about autism at all. They're about people and they're, they refer to the taming that all of our children go through as they are educated or as their children and they're growing up. Uh, we tame our children. We do. It's very true. When a child, typically developing child tantrums, you know, we typically will say, that's not good behavior. I don't want you tantruming. Go and calm down in your room or whatever it is and come back when you can talk. And that's kind of the same concept. Now, sometimes ABA providers that are not good might push it a little too far and they might not recognize that the child needs a break that the child needs additional rewards. These are important things. Like I always, um, when a child is having a lot of challenging behaviors, I really want to observe because it's important to make the therapy fair. So the therapy, if, if a child's having a lot of tantrums, you don't just ignore it. You make sure that it's the, what you're requesting is easy or you make it easier and you increase the rewards for the appropriate behavior. So you make it, more rewarding for the child to uh, have more rewarding and easier to have the appropriate behavior as opposed to the tantrum. So hopefully that that makes sense, Jenna. Do you know that's the thing? There are so many things that I quote you all the time, but that's the thing that I quote you say the most: that it has to be fair. And yeah. if we 
I'll take a moment every day and think about, okay, what is my child doing that is not working for me within my life that I wish that I could change or help them to grow or however you want to word it. If we would take a minute and think, what am I asking them to do and what are they getting out of it? And is it fair? Yeah. Is it a fair equation? It's, it's a whole different mind shift uh, for a caregiver, for a teacher, for, you know, anyone and thinking about and thinking, oh, well, okay, I, you know, how, how yeah. could I be fair? And I think yeah. one get into that mindset. Um, the thing that I always say to caregivers, because none of us want for our kids to ever be uncomfortable. We, none of us want for our kids to ever be frustrated. That's the truth. It hurts me when my child is frustrated. Physically, pain when he is frustrated. But the example that was told to me many years ago, which I always go back to, is when our kids are learning how to walk. Mm -hmm. And down and they hit their heads and they knock their heads on the coffee table and they fall down the stairs and it's horrible and it's yeah. it's you know shocking to us but at no point do we go well that's it forget it it's just too hard he's hurting himself in the attempt of learning it bring in the wheelchair yeah. get it we're giving up on the walking none of us say that and yeah. I think the difference is, is that we understand it is a phase that they are going to get through the frustration and that they are going to walk and then they're going to run. And, right. and there's a day very soon that our child, you know, occasionally we all fall, right? But they'll be able to handle it and that this is just part of their growing up process. And I wish that I could get families to see that with ABA, your child is going to get frustrated sometimes. That is absolutely true, but it's a part of them growing it, that's really natural. And that I do think you have to be careful that you're with the right ABA provider so that someone is not deliberately making things frustrating for your child. I absolutely think that that's something people should be aware of. But if you're with good quality ABA, they would never be doing that. And, and it's only, the frustration is only, as my son will tell you, nobody ever died from frustration. Frustration is what happens right before something changes better. Yeah, that's so true. That's what my son said. He went through five years of intensive ABA. So I think once you get into that mindset, it's still hard for your child to be frustrated, but it's, you understand what's happening and it's easier to allow them to move through the feelings of being frustrated. Yeah. Uh, because it's growth. So anyway, uh, did you want to take another question or I have a question? Yeah, there's, I'm going to take this question because there's uh, a, a lot of, there's about 10 that are okay. the same person. Okay. <clears throat> and this is, this is CC and um, it says, I've been told I have high functioning autism. I have worked in a laboratory as a meter, me, metrologist, I think maybe meteorologist, and I have gotten bored. I have decided to become a lawyer. I am in the process of doing this. I am finding this boring as well. My therapist told me that career change is typical, however, I am having trouble sticking to it. Is this HFA or my autism? Not sure I understand that. I find it easy, just like school when I was easy when I was younger. Um, also, I feel too embarrassed to tell my therapist because I don't want her to think she isn't helpful to me because she is helpful. Sometimes I don't tell her I have had a bad day because I feel like she would be upset. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> But there's actually one more which says, is this talk about low functioning autism? Are there cultural cues noted for nonverbal autism children or adolescent girls in particular? I'll go to that one later. But Cece, I think what you should do is, um, I think you uh, maybe want to talk more to, first of all, you should always be very open with your therapist. A good therapist is not going to get offended by anything. They're there for you. They're not your friend. They're your therapist. So you can all, you can tell them you've had a bad day. You can tell them you um, <clears throat> you can even tell them that particular sessions aren't helpful. You can tell them anything. Their job is to not get offended and to be there for you. That's the difference. That's why a good therapist is better than a good friend because <laughs> they never go away. They never get offended. But so how is that effective taking though? That's what I was really struck by. You're you're so much 
perspective taking that you're worried about your therapist, but you can let go of that. That is so good. That's such a great first point, Shannon. That's very true. So what I would say is you got to discuss this stuff with your therapist and maybe even with a job counselor, because it sounds like you're more, this is more about career counseling. And also, I mean, if you feel like these fields are boring, that means it's not kind of like maybe feeding your creative side or, or it's not satisfying to you. Um, a career counselor usually is better at helping you find things that you're truly interested in. A um, big, big difference going from being a scientist to a lawyer. So, you know, uh, maybe there's a third area or a fourth or multiple other areas that you can also engage in that would be more refreshing or rewarding for you. You might also want to get some testing done, like intelligence testing and so on. I have a lot of people who are extremely high intelligence in one area or another, and they find most of what goes on around them to be a little boring. So I think it's not a bad idea for you to do all of those things, and hopefully they will help you. Um, I, I want to let you ask questions, Shannon, too, but there's, um, there's a, I kind of skipped over a question, um, which, I, which I just want to, because it's from our, our dear friend, uh, Um. Um, so I just want to quickly say, this one says, hello, gorgeous ladies. And that's a nice one for us to start with. Had a question. I don't think that my child, 11, sees the difference between adults and kids. For example, when he talks to little kids, the expectation is for them to talk back to him. How do we know how he perceives himself? What program should I tell my supervisor to look into? That's really great. There is a program, I think it, when we named it, it's like I wrote these programs so many years ago, I don't even remember the names, but I think it was called something like Circle of Friends. And I think that particular program will teach your child uh, a bunch of the difference in everything between a friend, an acquaintance, a young child, an adult, someone you have to be, someone you're familiar with. Uh, or formal towards, and everything about that, how you talk with them, how you, uh, what types of um, language you can use, if you can interrupt them, if you have to be more polite, uh, who you can trust, who is like a friend, who's safe, that kind of stuff. So I think Circle of Friends might help. The other thing is the question you asked about how do we know how he perceives himself? That's an awesome question as well. And that's a whole different issue. And I think you should maybe, if you are concerned about that, uh, you can, or you can certainly ask your ABA team, um, but you can, uh, you know, he's pretty high functioning. And I think you can sit with him and have him help list the adjectives that describe him. And if he can't do that, you can, you can go through a series of adjectives with him um, and have him choose what he thinks he is. That's kind of a cool activity. I really like that. I might actually uh, tell someone at that card to add that into the curriculum because that's that's a pretty nice one to add. Can I toss in there too that, um, yeah. because he's right about at an age where you might want to look, um, Tom Island and his mother um, wrote a book uh, and it's, it's called, I think it's called Journey to Know Yourself. Um, we've done, Pieces on, it's a workbook to do with your child nice. where a bunch of exercises that aren't, um, I mean, it's, it's really clever the way they're done. So you answer questions and, and then you talk to each other about the questions and it helps you to know yourself, and know the person that you're doing it with. It helps them to take your perspective and for you to get their perspective. And it's really a great workbook to do around this age. Nice. Uh, Tom, you can find it at Tom Island's website, which I think is Tom Island, no S in the island.com. Um, and it's know yourself, but I think it's the journey to know yourself. Uh, but super cool workbook. Um, and I think you'd have a really good time doing it. Jem and I did it. Um, we didn't do all the exercises in the workbook, but the ones that we did have stuck with us and made us close. That's awesome. That's perfect. So Shannon, I'm going to let you take some questions, but I do want to correct myself that uh, Cece, the per previous person wrote back and said, 
metrologist is the science of measurement. So huh? thank you for that. That's very interesting. So now I, you, I, you know, I also wanted to say to that too, one of the things that I love about Dr. Grampiche is that she asks me and those around her all the time, like what she asks us all the time, what's re you don't say it, what's reinforcing. You say, what, what parts of your job do you really like? Like yeah. what, what would you like to be doing? And, and keeps us all like, keeps our creative juices running all the time. I've learned a lot from her about, you know, what to ask myself and what to ask other people. Um, because, you know, I think we've all been told that, well, eventually you have to work a job and it's going to be boring. I, I think we've all been sold that bill of goods. Um, but, I, you know, I think you're an amazing person to work with because you're constantly asking people what, what, what is the part of this that makes you tick? And you constantly want to feed that, which is an amazing thing to be around. Well, I mean, think about it though, Shannon, if there are things that you like to do, right. Versus things that you don't like to do. I mean, <laughs> we get the things that we like to do, we get done uh, with much higher quality and much faster efficiency and just, in you know the whole mood of the place is better we spend so many hours a day in our in our work so for, I, I often say like someone who you should never uh it, you should always strive to have a job that you really enjoy doing what you do because it's just gonna it's your life right and nobody wants to spend all of their life doing something that's boring for, for example or or just annoying Absolutely. Okay. So we have a question. Hi, I have an extremely bright, but stubborn eight-year-old boy with a new diagnosis of ASD level two. One of our struggles is his hyperactivity, fast moving, loud talking, acting silly, not listening. We see it a lot at home and school was reporting issues with that at the end of last year. He gets a lot of exercise during the summer, but school is starting soon. And I know that it will more difficult? Should we wait or be proactive and have him take movement breaks during his day? Also, he refuses to do any calming activity or swinging in his special swim. How do we convince him it will help regulate him? And they said, I'm grateful for your show. Yeah. Did you, <clears throat> there were a lot of little things in that one, Shannon. Do I have that question? Because I'm you trying to pull up do. all the details. Uh, towards the bottom, it's like in the middle. Okay. Hi bright but stubborn eight-year-old do you oh, see yeah. that great great yeah okay so new diagnosis at eight um and they say level two again i'm there's supposed to be two numbers on that so i'm not sure level two i, I would assume is kind of medium functioning um uh, and it's so but when you have a child who's just being diagnosed at at age eight that means they're extremely high functioning in, in terms of the autism spectrum. Uh, in, in other words, they did okay until now, right? I mean, it was noticeable. One of our struggles is his hyperactivity, fast moving, loud talking, acting silly and not listening. And that is um, very much defines kind of all the stuff about ADHD. Um, and it's possible that this individual has just basically a severe, you know, a lot of ADHD because ADHD people don't realize it's, it, and I'm glad that we've ended up changing the name of it, ADHD. It used to be just a, t a hyperactivity, but it isn't hyperactivity alone. It's also a lot of inattention, right? And that kind of describes, sometimes people confuse ADHD with ASD because the child is inattentive and distractible. And that's very similar to autism. Um, we see it a lot at home and school was reporting issues with it at the end of the last year. He gets a lot of exercise during the summer, but school is starting soon and I know that it'll become more difficult. Should we wait or be proactive, have him take movement breaks? Also, he refuses to do any calming activity or swinging uh, in his special, okay. So I really feel that you need to um, address the ADHD. So um, it's, it's, I think it's more about addressing the ADHD. And I don't think he has a diagnosis of ADHD. It looks like you're seeing hyperactivity. I don't know if he's also been diagnosed with ADHD because 
once you have that diagnosis, the therapy, the treatment is is dual, right? So it's it's a combination of uh, cognitive behavioral or applied behavioral ABA type activities, but also with the help of some medication. And of course, people have different feelings about medication for children. But I got to tell you, ADHD is when it's really clearly diagnosed is one of those diagnoses that I am a strong supporter of medication, especially the new medications for ADHD. And I'll tell you why. Because it is extremely difficult for children to regulate themselves without the help of that particular, those particular uh, medications. And as they grow up and become adults, a lot of other things, um, they start to do other things to help them regulate. Um, and I, you know, I don't want to, no, no cause to scare any parent. But just as an example, it, children with ADHD who go untreated um, constitute, like, are far more likely to have alcohol addiction. And the reason for that is because they're trying to find something to help them calm down. And alcohol is a depressant and it works. So help them calm down by when they're a child, giving them something that will help them regulate. I think for your child, if he's having such a hard time taking like breaks and or doing those things that is just not helping him, perhaps. Um, so maybe focus a little bit more on like maybe talk to a specialist for ADHD. Maybe um, there are some really good books on how to manage uh, attention deficit hyperactivity with children. Um, and then again, as I said, please talk to a psychiatrist and get some uh, consider some medication and see if that helps. And can I make a plug for going as organic as possible and reducing exposure to pesticides? Because we and sugars and dyes, all of that. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, studies keep trickling out, but we've known for quite a while that, uh, especially orga uh, organophosphate, I believe, is the one that it shows up a small amount of it. Um, shows up in children's urine and can directly uh, go back to the amount of ADHD symptoms that they're displaying. So as organic as possible, as quick as possible. Um, we always encourage you to look at the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15 on EW.org. They change them every year. That way you can know, you don't have to buy everything organic because it gets expensive. Um, but that there are some things that you should never have conventionally grown, especially for your children. But I think for, uh, because they're just doused in pesticides. And I think it's, I, I've, I've seen in our lives that it's made a difference. And I've heard from so many families, uh, that it makes a difference. Definitely. So Shannon, I have, uh, one last follow-up from Ashwath where she asks, um, should I send my three-year-old kid to preschool with the therapist or ABA therapy center or both? I don't want to exhaust her. And I completely get that. I think what you should do at the age of three is just have ABA. That's what I would do. Because I, when you start, so a couple of things, although it depends on your child's functioning as well. Um, I try to make sure that before my child gets into the school environment, they have enough skills that they can do well amongst peers. I don't want my child going to school and being the only one who can't follow instructions or the only one who doesn't have language. Or the, I want my child to feel a little bit more like they can actually, they know, for instance, things like, how do I approach a group of children and interact with them? How do I, you know, all those types of important social skills. So if your child has those, then certainly you can have your child in some preschool activity as well as ABA. If your child doesn't have those, your child is very young. So you can certainly do more ABA. And then when the child is more like four, integrate into pre-K, let's say. And then you can do a little bit of uh, each pre-K and ABA. And then when they turn five, 
uh, you know, depending on the level and what your child has learned, you can start, you gradually increase school as you reduce ABA. But remember, ABA, think of ABA, especially for the high functioning child, as just tutoring to help your child kind of keep up and, and excel, um, not in their academic skills, because most high functioning kids don't need that, but in their language and social and kind of those soft skills, cognitive skills that are that are hard for kids on the spectrum. Yeah, I just want to say, I just want to put, a, you know, a hug on everyone who's got kids going back to school right now, because especially with all of the different changes and the, you know, yeah. the mass, some aren't, it's just harder than ever to know yeah. right for your child. I do want to say that tomorrow, Bonnie Yates, special education attorney will be joining us. Uh, if you guys have questions that you want to write in right now or as soon as possible, so I can send them on to Bonnie, because a lot of you are asking saying, okay, we started school. We don't like how going what can we do we thought it was going to be this great social thing for our kiddo but with the masks it turns out it's not what, what you know what are our rights feel free to write in what your circumstances are so we can ask Bob tomorrow i i want to thank dr grand pichet for being so patient with all of our technical <laughs> issues this morning hopefully we're going to have those figured out for tomorrow i want to thank all of you guys for being here i want to uh encourage you to please Check out the other videos that we have. We are live the rest of this week and we are live all next week. I know we've been off and you guys have been like, where are you? We're back. We're back. We're rested. We're lean, mean fighting machine here. So uh, make sure that you tune in because we've got some really great uh, topics that are coming up in the coming weeks. Uh, I, I feel like I had one more thing that uh, somebody asked about homeschooling. Uh, do you have any recommendations about that? Because we have about a minute, Dr. Grampichet. Yeah, I mean, it's a personal choice, don't you think, Shannon, on homeschooling? A lot of people actually are moving towards that. Uh, to some extent, everything that happened during the COVID year felt a lot like homeschooling, right? Because the kids were having a very hard time learning on online, and so parents had to kick in and pick up. And I feel really, it's just terrible that that burden was placed on parents. But then there are also families that feel like their children will get a lot more out of homeschooling. And, and that can actually be very true. I think if you do homeschooling, my only suggestion is that you make sure you have um, some social uh, activities also lined up for your child, um, like, you know, sports or other clubs or things that they can be a part of around other kids. But I actually don't see anything wrong with homeschooling for families. In fact, it's probably one of the things we'll talk about with Bonnie tomorrow. We have a lot of families that be, due to COVID and because COVID, their school has not been able to accommodate their child's IEP. The schools are actually paying yeah. for the home program and sometimes paying for the ABA team to be in the home school. So, uh, that's a distinct possibility. All right, we are officially out of time now. I want to thank Dr. Grand Pichet again. You're amazing and uh, the troop. You're a true trooper. We're going to be back again tomorrow, as I said, uh, with Bonnie Yates. And then on Friday, Nancy Allspot Jackson here and Vince Redman, licensed marriage family therapist, will be with us on Friday. You will not want to miss all of that. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. Bye. Thanks for watching Autism Live. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.